Hello and welcome to this SimScale webinar on cooling strategies for data centers. Welcome everybody on this nice European evening and good morning to all our listeners in the US. Um, um, just to make sure that we are actually right now mm, that you can properly hear me, um, make sure that please raise your hands that so we confirm that you can see the screen and that you can hear me right now. So I'd really appreciate if you could use the GoToMeeting functionality before we begin to check if you actually hear me speaking and if you can see the screen. I still do not see, I see a lot of hands appearing. This is great. Thank you very much. Uh, great. Uh, for those of you uh, who cannot find, the, there is a possibility of listening using a uh, phone. Let me just type this in the chat. All right. The rise hand option uh, will be used throughout this presentation. Let's just, before moving on with all the talk, uh, let's agree on, on some basic rules. I will try to answer questions as they arrive throughout the presentation, although I would highly appreciate if you could uh, hold with them uh, until the end so that uh, while well, we, we get like a nice workflow and a nice thought pro pattern um, that uh, is going on throughout the presentation. All right, with no further ado, let's jump in. Once again, welcome to the SimScales webinar on cooling strategies for data centers. My name is Pavel Sosnowski. I am the customer success engineer at SimScale. I've been working for quite long over here. Um, my specialization is environmental industrial fluid mechanics, and I've been dealing with quite a lot of applications of the customers of SimScale. It's my pleasure to be your host today, and I hope that you will enjoy this session. If you have any follow-up questions or would like to get in touch with me directly, you can find me at this email address. Without further ado, let's begin. What is why is it are we interested in uh, data center cooling strategies? Well, most importantly, it is because cooling takes up around 50% of the energy consumption of a data center overall. There are many other aspects, but this is the place where you can actually have significant cost reductions of your process. In fact, when we are looking at the graph that uh, tells us about the general usage of energy for big data centers, we notice that well, basic interpolation of the trend that we were expecting to have around 2010 was that, well, it will be exponentially growing and we will end up having quite a lot of trouble. Fortunately, there were some significant improvements when it comes to the infrastructure and the server savings, meaning that we improved the ways that we're cooling our data centers, we improved the performance of the devices themselves. So today, the trend is uh, rather flat. Well, it's still rising, but it's not as dramatic as it was. Um, but most importantly, we see two areas where we can actually significantly improve the data, set, the data center performance, that is the, the server savings, so the power that is actually being consumed by the devices themselves, and the infrastructure savings, which is the device that cooled the, the tools. Now, there are many aspects when it comes to choosing the location of a data center, when it comes to choosing the proper tools, proper uh, hardware, and so on and so forth. I will not go too much into detail because we are all here to, to learn a little more on how the simulations want to go. And I'm sure that most of you would be able to 
tell me much more about data center location and cho choice of climate um, that is most suitable to facilitate high computing um, operations. But what we are actually interested in is are the adapting of cooling strategies within a data center that is actually being built. Uh, we are, there are many aspects to that and our comparison or our example that we're doing today will be focusing on the approach of the hot or cold aisle and the containment of such an aisle, the benefits that we get by applying such a strategy. What does it mean to have a hot cold aisle uh, containment and hot or cold aisle structure for a data center? Well, basically we will assume that there will be, we, we will have rows of servers standing in a big room and we'll have consecutive row between the between the rows of the structure of these structures we'll have consecutive aisles where from the bottom we will supply cold air and the next aisle that will be connecting to backs of the service will be extracting hot air uh, and moving it to the recirculation units now this has its advantages. Well, we know that um, we will not be pushing hot air from one server to the other. At the same time, well, the na a naive approach would be, well, we just keep the building as it is and put the suction. But there is a significant chance that the re recirculation or air circulation within the room will still allow for the hot air to circulate within the within the zone and decrease the efficiency of cooling that we could have if we actually contained the hot aisle or contained the, the cold aisle. And actually we have two possible configurations. We could cl completely close the cold aisle and have the cold air arrive through it, not allowing it to mix with the hot part that is around um, that is uh, being pushed out. Or there is the second approach where we are containing the hot aisle, simply creating a big channel of hot air that is being directly pushed into the cabinet that drives the flow out and processes the air. So this is another look at the, the approach of contained hot aisle. We are not allowing the, the hot air to recirculate. We are building some kind of a barrier and it actually doesn't have to be a very, let's say, thermal resistant one, although this might also help if we are really concerned about potential heat losses within such a system. Now, how is it connected to um, the, the standards themselves? Or what kind of standards uh, are we applying to these um, these things. One of the standards, a very predominant one, is the ASHRAE Technical uh, Standard 9.1, which would identify the amount of humidity and the temperature that is supposed to be provided to any electronic equipment or IT equipment as an input for uh, the air that is ventilating such a, such a device. The standard itself is rather big, but we are focusing right now on the ways that CFD, or computational fluid dynamics, and in general, computed aid and engineering can help us cope with the standard. In this case, we are looking at the performance of the temperature range at the inlet of an IT equipment. And we will be considering if our temperature of the air we're supplying to the device stays within a certain range. Different simulation types allow us to check and confirm that we are within the standard for other purposes or other, uh, other properties of the flow. In this case, we're mostly focusing on the temperature part. Now, why is this important? Well, I would say, hey, I could push a lot of air, a lot of cold air and be sure that, well, I get a performance that I need and that the temperature is always below the desired 27 degrees and it's not too cold. But on the other hand, if we are able to properly optimize the system itself 
and the design of the room, the design of the recirculation patterns that are within the domain, we could significantly reduce the costs, the operational costs for a data center. Some other standards uh, or some other ASHRAE standards that uh, facilitate this kind of uh, analysis are the ASHRAE 90.4, which focuses on the energy consumption. And one would say, hey, the, these standards are mostly that you can calculate these standards based on the general understanding of the, of the design of a data center. I have 50 servers, I have uh, or 50 stacks of servers, I have a room that is that big. Uh, each one of them provides that much power. I have a certain amount of pumps and the data center has a certain um, energy input. But then if we want to optimize it and make sure that we are actually having a proper efficient system that does not consume that much energy and still is within the standard, we can use uh, computational fluid dynamics. This also goes to the standard 90.1, where by minimizing the energy or minimizing the temperature that is created or the, or the amount of heat that is being created at the device or by making sure that we have efficient ventilation, we are reducing the amount of energy that the IT equipment requires or it's uh, that at which it is operating. And since we are having the, the equipment operating at more favorable temperatures, we are getting better performance of this equipment, increasing the, the, uh, our, the overall performance of the data center. And for example, the power usage efficiency goes up. We get more for less energy that we're putting into the equipment itself. Well, right now, for, let's talk about the design scenarios that I would like to present to you right now. We'll have two different design variations. One of them will be the na a naive approach or the old approach where we have our uh, racks of uh, servers positioned in these in the six in six rows. Well, there's one, two, three, four, five, and six, counting from the left. And there is one small rack in a separated room that you can see um, up a little bit up to the front. We have three computer room air circulation units or air conditioning units positioned in the back that will be taking the air out of the system and will be uh, later introducing it down into the into the base the bottom side of the of the room the air will be entering the room from the bottom uh, the the raised floor through uh, small openings uh, racks that that allow it to to go into the cold aisles a second optimized approach will we will consider having isolated aisles, uh, the isolated hot aisles that will be taking away the heat through the top boundaries. We will not actually uh, simulate the plenum itself. We will consider the air to be immediately removed into the air, the air conditioning units. And in this case, we will also have uh, different types of optimized flow. Notice that on the leftmost hot aisle, when we look at the leftmost hot aisle, it's completely isolated from uh, from the flow. It's basically we have all the, the server racks, then the hot aisle. The second hot aisle looks very similar to the first one, although if you have a careful look at the ser the server racks that are closest to us. You will notice that they are empty. Let me try to uh, get my spotlight tool. I hope that you can see the spotlight. We have uh, we have empty racks at the very front, which is semi open, making a semi opening to the hot aisle and will allow some kind of air recirculation. And the third type is uh, rack, which is actually not 
isolated. There are suction outlets or uh, open outlets that will be taking the air away from the system. Although on the side walls, they, they, there is a complete opening of this device. All right. So why should we use the simulations at all? In general, whenever we are building such a facility, we'll start with a certain design, we'll build a physical prototype, um, then perform the thermal testing, and in case it is not compliant with what we are expecting, we will make a design change. Whenever we're building data centers, we have tremendous amount of experience, and this allows us to basically follow guidelines of what we know in order to avoid big problems. Most of the time, if you are trying to comply with ASHRAE standards, you will end up having a working and reliably efficient data center. The problem arises when you actually build the thing and you find out that your servers are overheating. It is rather hard to imagine that we'll start rebuilding the whole facility. And this is why it is important to have an understanding of the performance of such a system before it is built, before we even make the first prototype, because in many cases we will not be able to build the first prototype at all. We will have to take an educated guess, we will have to base on our experience, and although it's very good at most of the times, sometimes it might lead to a disaster. But uh, the good thing is, with the use of the simulations, we can reduce the risk, we can reduce the number of physical testing that we actually need to perform in order to get a reliable understanding. Thus, we are saving a lot of money. SimScale will allow you to do all of that in your web browser. We are the first world's cloud-based CAE platform with uh, full functionality that allows you to run very complex analysis. We are accessible. You do not need any hardware. No, <laughs> actually, you do not need to build a data center to run your simulations. Although for most complex uh, analysis tools, you will actually need a very powerful machine to run these problems. SimScale is cost efficient. With a flexible pricing model, you get uh, very good performance and very good value for what you pay. And it's for everyone. There are hundreds of projects already present in our public databases, which can be used as templates for your analysis. Also, the projects that we are showing here will later be available uh, for you to take a look, investigate, change a bit, and see how can you apply them to your applications and use them as a template to start and kick off your own analysis of a data center. Uh, the whole workflow of SimScale happens in the, in the web browser. You upload your CAD from the very good tool that you're using. We are supporting quite a lot of formats right now, although we are sticking to what we're good at, that is the simulations, which is set up in the browser, and later you're able either to post-process them online using our post-processing tools, or you can download the results and use third-party tools to make the even better visualizations. There are lots of uh, different analysis types and capabilities that you can work with from conduction, convection, CHD, conjugated heat transfer, where we model the thermal behavior of the air flow or fluid flow with the solid flow within, steady state transit. There is a lot of type, types of analysis and even more. It's not only computational fluid dynamics, but also structural mechanics, thermodynamics, or thermomechanical simulations. All right, that was quite a lot of talking. Now it's time to have a demo. Before I jump to the platform, I would like to first um, show you the overview of the case that I will be discussing. Basically, uh, we'll focus our attention during this short demo on the baseline case where we have the simulation without the uh, called the division between the cold and the hot aisles. Well, the, the system is configured that, but we do not have the insulated aisles to be working. Um, so we have the core cold inlets in the bottoms uh, that are pushing the air downwards into the uh, below the floor, the, the 
below the floor. Then for each and rack, we'll have 60 watts of power support supplied through the top plate of, uh, of the server, making it 120 watts for each and every of these slots that you have that you can see on the on the screen. Okay, let's jump to the platform. I already opened the project and uh, well, whenever you do it yourself, uh, please be aware that it might require some time for it to load. Uh, at least when we are talking about this case, it's a very complicated geometry and it might need some time for it to be processed. But overall, the performance, this is all running live in a web browser. Um, there are many formats that you can actually use and upload. Right now, we are supporting STEP, IGS, STL, SOLIDWORKS, Autodesk Inventor, and Rhino. We are willing to extend this, and we will be extending this base uh, further. And th this actually depends on uh, the, the requirements coming from our customers. There is a question about uh, Revit. There is a rather straightforward workflow that you can use in order to import the tools to, uh, to SimScale from Revit. You would save them into another format that is compliant with one of the standards here. So either you will get a step or an Autodesk Inventor uh, tool uh, or, or other format that later can be imported into SimScale. We have customers who do that uh, all the time. Now, after importing them, there is one more way to actually get your designs into SimScale. Uh, you can uh, import them directly from Onshape. This is one of the first, or well, this is the first uh, online and the best online CAD tool available right now on the market. If you haven't heard of it, you should definitely check it out. We have direct integration with, with this tool. Okay. Once we uploaded the geometry to our platform, we will need to follow a few steps that allow us to run the simulation itself. Uh, first step is performing what's called the uh, domain discretization. We will be splitting this room into, I would say, pixels uh, that will later be used for, for the analysis type. This is called creating a mesh. In this case, we are dealing with a mesh that is over 18 million cells. We needed to have a sufficient mesh refinement uh, in the areas that are connecting the underfloor compartment and the top part and sufficiently fine mesh around the servers themselves. This is also why it takes a second for, for the whole system to load. I actually have it preloaded in the simulation designer, so now it will it will be uh, loading in the background, but we can also see the mesh in this section over here. Right now I'm visualizing the surfaces, but I can also switch to the mesh with wireframe. And these are the pixels, these are, these are the, the control volumes that actually will allow us to get a certain precision of the flow inside the room. Um, yes, that is it. And now, once we do that, once we load a case, once we mesh it, we can choose one of the many simulation types that are available on the platform. In this particular case, we went with what's called the convective heat transfer simulation with a certain turbulence model. We'll be working on a steady state problem um, and trying to get an understanding of what's going on in the domain. Now, one very powerful aspect of the platform itself is that once you learn a single workflow for a single simulation type, you will be la later able to mimic it for any other simulation type. We're keeping it consistent as much as possible. So even a workflow that you will be following for this convective heat transfer, you could later apply on a thermomechanical simulation of your server or on any kind of other ventilation problem that you're dealing with. And the workflow itself, although at the very beginning it might seem a little 
daunting is rather simple. You go from top to the bottom of the simulation tree that appears on the left side in the navigator panel and you start setting up the properties. Put up gravity, make it actually work. Add a material, we're supposed to work with air. The air itself will have certain properties. We'll need to initialize our simulation and say, what was the pressure inside our device? Was there any temperature? What was the temperature at the very beginning? What are the turbulent properties? And so on and so forth. Then we jump to the most important part, that is the definition of the boundary conditions that will allow us to understand how does the system operate itself. So for example, we'll set up adiabatic, so perfectly insulated walls, the external walls on the side. We'll say that the floor behaves in a certain way. We will put the tilts that uh, get the air go in. And this takes a second because there's over, over 1800 faces <laughs> that put the air circulating in this system. Uh, we will have uh, some other walls and then the interesting part that are the inlets. In this case, we were setting up a certain velocity inlet and we we're pushing at a fixed temperature. We're assuming that our air conditioning units are operating in a certain, with a certain precision. For the outlets, we're using uh, an open outlet. So the flow will adjust itself based on the overall flow patterns within the domain. Then for the racks, this is just the walls of the racks. We are setting them to be again adiabatic. So we don't want to have thermal contribution of these elements to the system because they're actually submerged in this path. And then we are applying some other server sides. These are the small faces on the sides. We are considering that they are not actually generating heat, but it is the server top and bottom faces that will be generating 60 watts of power. Um, so in this case, when you're looking at a server rack, you see there is, this is the, the element itself. This is the top rack side, and this is the bottom rack side. This is where the heat will be generated. Now, there is an interesting problem that we have to deal with. How do we make these servers move the air around this domain? Because in general, actually right now, there is nothing pushing the air except for the inlet itself that is moving with, uh, let's double check, with a quarter meter per second. That is not much. Well, there is a very smart way to mimic the presence of the fans that will be positioned between the racks. What you can do is create, first, you can create what's called a geometry primitive. That is a Cartesian box. This is a virtual object that actually does not exist um, in the domain itself. Uh, this is a big, big thing. Uh, so it takes a while for it to load. Let me switch back to the surface mode. It will be working a little faster. So notice that I created a very uh, small, a very small uh, box. And this box is assigned to be a momentum source uh, that will be actually pushing the air in the y directions with uh, 10 centimeters per second. So any air that arrives here will be pushed. Oh, it's still, I know what's going on. It's actually selecting the surface, so it's selecting the whole domain. So it will be pushing the air as if these boxes were representing some kind of virtual fan that is uh, moving. There, there is a very interesting question for the CRAC units. Are we using atmospheric pressure or any other pressure? This is actually uh, dependent. You can actually use the, the values that you have measured or that your supplier gives you. That this will be the pressure at, this, uh, at the device itself. Uh, an interesting thing is that uh, for this kind of simulation, you have a relative pressure that you're calculating. It's not the absolute pressure. So it will be automatically adjusted to, to the outlets themselves. In general, you could also 
consider using suction outlets that would remove a fixed amount of uh, a fixed amount of uh, air and, and they, that they would be sucking. So what is uh, de depending on on the speed uh, of the fan well uh, in this case we simply made an assumption that this will be 10 centimeters per second and this is true for all the mm, for all the racks if we were to show all the other cartesian boxes like uh, they are actually present within the each rack but you can specify them individually for every kind of uh, device that you have so if you have a specification of your fan which you should have you can decide that well the fan is operating at a much far faster speed and uh, use this as uh, as your reference uh, speed for for the analysis in this case as i said uh, for each rack we are giving 10 centimeters per second of the flow and we're simply creating what's called momentum source next we move forward we do not um, we, we reduced a little bit uh, some of the properties uh, most of the time we're trying to update these numerical settings so that you don't have to tackle with them and that they will give you some reasonable uh, values as you go then here you have another example of the power of the platform itself since you are able to decide on how big of a machine do you want your analysis to run simscale gives you access from 1 to 32 cores of computing power for a free account and if you get a paid account or uh, you, you might also get 96 cores um, so and you can run any number of simulations at the same time on uh, any number of machine on, on any combination of these machines so you could um, I, it's very common that they have customers who run five ten simulations at once they come back after a few hours and they get their results they are able to process them and work with uh, with all the data without having to wait weeks sometimes to analyze and run the simulation itself all right we're almost at the bottom of the navigator meaning that we are almost ready to set up our first simulation simscale uh, one more thing to do is to get some average data for example getting the outflow averages uh, some data over particular server elements that we could gather and monitor throughout the simulation after all the setup is done all we have to do is click create a new simulation now it will take a sec give it a name and click start I will not do that since we already performed this calculation uh, and we will jump to the post processor uh, to take a look at the results so the simulation gives you an overview of how is it performing based on the residuals you can also monitor the output of uh, temperature profiles the velocities of the result control items as they are developing throughout the simulation itself and obviously you can also show your results in the flow this is a very simple visualization that i'm doing here right now which shows you a threshold of <coughs> excuse me of temperature um, but of course since this is a pretty big analysis type we needed to make some post-processing beforehand and this is what i'll jump back into our presentation let's take a look at uh, the baseline case and the performance of what's going on this is a slice at around the middle of the rack and you can see the velocity profiles <coughs> and the streamlines that are developing within the system uh, the cold aisles are the places where we have most of the flow and the fastest flow present because well we are simply pushing the air through them if you take a look from the top you can clearly see um, the flow velocity profiles there's a lot of velocity going on around and there are certainly 
a set, some recirculation zones, which are marked over here with this red dashed zones. So our hot air exiting from the surface is returning back to the hot, the cold side, reducing the efficiency of our data center. This is an interesting uh, section plane that will present, that will show you actually this is the, the thing that is happening. If you look from the top, you can see as uh, there are recirculation cells which reduce our efficiency. Furthermore, as we have seen in the simulation setup, our fans were not positioned throughout all the racks and there was some empty space on the top of every, uh, every um, section. This allows for the air, for the hot air to recirculate back and go to the hot, uh, from hot aisle to the cold one. This is what I'm trying to show right now. Maybe let me grab the pointer once again, oh, the, the spotlight. So we are, for example, here, it's very clearly we can see on the second from the right rack that there is a very significant amount of flow that is moving backwards instead of going directly into our into our um, compu uh, computer uh, air conditioning unit. This is another uh, slice. This time we are showing the temperature profiles. We see the temperature rise at the server sides. Well, we are pretty low uh, when it comes to, to the slice and the temperatures are more or less homogeneous because we have a very good circulation of air inside the domain. Once again, if we take a closer look at the temperature profiles, it is clear to see that some servers will be operating above the desired um, 27 degrees and even more the red zones which indicate uh, the, the hot aisles, these are supposed to be the hot aisles, they are a little hotter, but at the same time in the cold sections we have a lot of area uh, a little above the ground where we do not comply with the standards and where our service will not be properly cooled. This is another section, this time we are looking at the temperature profile uh, very close to the floor so that well, we confirm that there is some circulation going on and that we are actually trying to input a certain amount of hot air. But as we move upwards, these effects are mitigated and the circulation and the recirculation takes over, reducing the efficiency of our data center. For an improved design, this is another simulation that we set up. I will not be jumping to the setup itself just to save time. We'll consider the improved results and how did they affect. If we take a look at the velocity profiles, this time uh, there are barriers that will separate the hot aisles from most of the elements. And if you take a look at the velocity contour, you will notice the effect that I mentioned at the very beginning where we had the three different scenarios. So the bottom, two bottom rows of servers, they are comp have a completely isolated hot aisle and there is a very nice flow that goes from the cold aisles inside and it's not being distributed. On the other hand, if we look at the third and fourth row of servers, we had two racks that were empty and did not have any servers in them. Or, for example, they had a not working servers with uh, significant space allowed. This will imply, uh, will allow significant air recirculation to happen from the hot aisle outwards to the cold aisle between the second and the third rack, if you look from, if we count from the bottom, and will significantly reduce the performance of the door of, of our system. A very similar thing is happening with the last rack, the fifth one on the top, where the air is uh, being recirculated in this uh, very nice circle pattern on the top left. You can see 
a high velocity profile or relatively high velocity um, circulation. And this is uh, very much uh, confirmed when you take a look at the slice from the side. Of course, you could have more of this section views to have a better understanding of how the flow is moving inside the domain. And then another visualization, this time we're looking at the temperature slices very close to the floor. Uh, sorry, this is in the middle, uh, this is close to the floor. Another section uh, with uh, some temperature contours to confirm that we're actually having the, the hot air being pushed away through the hot aisle and how does it differ from, from the one that we are having. At the cold ones, and again, this time we can see that, well, that we definitely improved the performance of the whole server room, but there is more to be done in order to comply with the standard uh, and make sure that all the servers from the bottom to the top are served with proper air quality or proper air temperature. These are some more section views uh, looking at the temperature profiles. We're moving upwards. This is in the middle of the of the section of the sections of all the servers. And close to the outlets. This is at the top where we have the openings which allow or which have even more temperature. Now let's compare the results and see if we actually did change something. If you would take a look at the average rack temperature for every row of servers, uh, we can see a significant improve, improvement in the, the temperature. We reduce the temperature at which the, the servers are operating or at what, what kind of temperature of the servers do we have. It depends, of course, where the rack is positioned and what is which row of, uh, of servers are we talking about, but the improvement is definitely there. And if we were to use uh, the power consumption or calculate, estimate the power consumption based on the temperature, the operating temperature of the given rack, um, based on some manufacturers uh, references that we have available, we can definitely we can also quant quantify the amount of power that we will be able to save and how much well basically how much money we save for uh, thanks to these improvements. Now I know what you're asking how can I start to go and work with SimScale all you have to do is log in to our web page that is simscale.com you can Start simulating within a few minutes create, by creating an account that is completely for free. Or you can schedule a demo with us. Talk with our representatives and they will be very, very happy to answer your questions, answer your queries and help you on your way in getting your simulations working. All right. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. I write, uh, we are not ending right now. I know that there are some pending questions which I will be answering in a second. But for those of you who are not interested, thank you very much for being here with us. I hope that you enjoyed this webinar. And I will later on, for those of you who had any trouble with the connection or with the audio, we'll be providing recordings of this webinar. All right, let's go to the Q&A session, my favorite part. Still have some time left. Okay, so uh, let's start from the top because I see there are some trouble with the sound. There is a question about uh, the, uh, the way to apply um, power to the racks. Um, what do I refer to when on um, top of the bottom? I think I already had the chance to, to explain that uh, throughout the talk. That's why we are leaving the Q&A session at the very end. Uh, so, so you don't have to uh, say jump from one subject to the other. So once again, uh, when we are talking about applying power, we were having the top side of the server and the bottom side, the top and bottom of the elements. 
can just grab another view because this is very high. So this is the top side of the server and bottom side of the server. Now, notice that whenever you, this is an aside information that I would like to give you whenever you will be trying to apply your own boundary conditions and your own uh, your own simulations. Whenever you're applying a wall boundary condition with a certain amount of power, in this case it's 60 watt, this power will be applied on every surface that is selected. So in this case we have 912 faces selected. If you multiply it by 60, this is the total power that is applied in this domain. If you don't like it, you can also use the heat flux condition, which uh, defines the amount of watts per square meter so that we have a certain uniform distribution of uh, energy that is introduced into the system. Okay. Um, how can I uh, define interfaces between different geometries? I'm not exactly sure what you mean by interfaces, but uh, basically right now you could actually take results from one simulation at a certain slice and apply them as boundary conditions. This is a key word, as boundary conditions on the other fluid flow simulations. For structural analysis, this is a little more tricky uh, and it's not supported uh, with, it, it is supported to a limited, uh, to a limited application range. So yes, you, you can use the results from one simulation as a boundary condition for the others. But when it comes to modifications of geometries per se, we do not focus our attention on geometry operations. We do what we do best, that is simulating, and we leave the CAD modifications and, mod uh, and CAD operations to the experts, like, for example, our partners in Onshape or any other vendor that is providing reliable CAD tools. Uh, there was a question about the CRAC units and the outlet pressure. I think I answered this throughout the, during the presentation. And also, how do we know the speed of the fan? Mm. So there is a question like that's there's a very good note that uh, server fans can be having variable speeds, uh, working faster or slower depending on uh, the performance of the device. So in this particular case, uh, we are using a steady state simulation. So overall, we are considering an operational condition that is uh, that the servers themselves were working for infinite amount of time, or sufficiently long time to establish a certain flow regime. Um, so in this case, you would run the first simulation with the reasonable conditions that you assume that would be working for you, and then you could adjust the fan speeds uh, for your next simulation in order to have a different performance. Um, a functionality like having a variable a fan speed based on the flow, this is, uh, this is a very complex logic that would require some automated simulation tools, which we do not support yet, but a very interesting idea, I would say. Uh, okay. Are there any training videos for students? You should definitely go to YouTube and search for SimScale. We have a ton of materials available for free. And even more, if you're interested, we have it on our web page. So all you have to do is go to simscale.com. Let me try to go to simscale.com and uh, go to learning. There, uh, there are the tutorials, webinars, there's the whole academy, there's the forum, which is a great place to learn. Do go there and become even better uh, simulation, uh, with, with simulations. Any, are there any free license for students? SimScale is free for everyone. You can actually start simulating completely for free. Um, the only catch is that your knowledge, you need to share your knowledge with others. We really believe in the community. We really believe in collaboration of engineers uh, in order to make the world a better place. So 
if you are willing to share your expertise to create public projects, then you can simulate for free on SimScale. And look at this. These are all simulations done by people who wanted to share their knowledge. You can use them as a starting point for your own analysis. Then, if you need privacy, you can contact us and you will be able to create private projects. In fact, this data center simulation, notice that there is a little lock over here. This means that you will not be able to see this particular simulation, this copy, because we don't want to flood the whole place with uh, 50 different copies of the same project. But yeah, so go on, check, uh, check SimScale. Uh, another question, have you modeled boundary force so you don't need artificial momentum sources? Uh, well, in this case, we are creating, uh, well, what you could actually do for, for the whole simulation that we're dealing up uh, with here, you could create a little fan over here and you could create what's called an arbitrary mesh interface simulation. AMI, uh, so MRF, multi-reference frame or arbitrary measure interface, which would have a rotating domain that is actually a fan. But the approach would require you to have a sufficiently fine mesh of the problem. And imagine this, there are few hundreds of fans over here. If you want to have sufficiently fine mesh and sufficiently fine resolution for each and every fan that is present in this domain, that will create an enormous system to calculate. I don't think that you, well, you could run them on a supercomputer that would consist of a few thousand cores, but does it really, is it really worth it? In this case, you are making an engineering assumption that will allow you to have a sufficiently reasonable approximation of the performance of a device and still you get valuable data. So it's a trade-off. You could also uh, argue that you could make a simulation of a single section of, of such, a, uh, such a rack and see how does it perform and then use this knowledge in order to improve the performance of individual fans in the simulation. All right. Um, do we have a library of items for more realistic simulations, for example, specific server or cooling units? So in this case, you would have to look for the public project, uh, for the public projects that are here. Uh, I do not recall directly server cooling units, but there are some electronic cooling simulations. The whole thing is that you do not put for, for a simulation like this, you are not putting like a block that later will be behaving in a certain way. You need to have an understanding of how does it perform and you're simulating the behavior of the whole system. I hope that this, uh, this gets to the question. Uh, so are there uh, any available libraries with commonly used equipment, again, servers, uh, crack, uh, crack or uh, other devices. So for, for this, I have to say no, there, there, there are no direct libraries, but you could up, you could use these conditions that if, if you have them noted down, then you will say, okay, this is an inlet, this is an outlet. An interesting topic, uh, I'll definitely bring this up to our development team, and hopefully at some time we will have a library of such items. How can we simulate side-cooled equipment like uh, routers? Rotors. Well, in this case, I would say that uh, well, the whole setup that we have here is a very uh, is a very particular application. But you could see some um, in the public public domain. You have electronic cooling simulations of particular devices. This is a very nice simulation, CHD simulation, where we're actually analyzing the performance, the heat performance of a device itself. And later, based on the knowledge that you get from a simulation, a simulation of such a device, an individual device, you can apply this on a larger scale, ana scale analysis and make certain assumptions about the performance of each rack. Uh, 
Uh, next question. So for the meshing, there's uh, that uh, that the, the we are, we're there's a question that uh, I should need filling air, but uh, it's likely that you mesh the equipment racks and such. So basically, in this case, we are only simulate uh, meshing the air. All these racks that you have here, they are actually well, hollow inside. If you if you were to take a look, I'll hide this. This is an empty space. It does not contain any mesh inside. I like to think about the meshing process as if you were pouring molten lava into, into a domain and basically looking at the negative of the domain. So in this case, we made certain simplifications to, to the design of, of the server itself as you can clearly see, and then we mesh the air domain. Okay. Does Onshape have programmed racks and cracks? That I don't know. I'm really sorry. Uh, he would have to ask the, the Onshape guys. But I know that uh, they have a very big library of standard elements. And even if they do not have uh, such equipment, they also have a huge public library of projects. And you can also uh, contact other designers who, who have them. And some of them provide it for free. Some, they, I think they even have a marketplace right now. Um, there are some questions about buoyancy forces. Buoyancy forces are being simulated within this project. So we are actually having hot air moving up. This is why we had to specify the direction of gravity. A very common mistake. Uh, well, you will get a warning if you do not set gravity properly. Uh, but uh, back in the day when the warning was not there, I can't tell you how many times I was simulating uh, buoyancy flows on International Space Station simply because there was no gravity. So yes, we're we are having buoyancy forces in action. Uh, back to the, the other question about the fans. Uh, for the momentum sources, there's only constant velocity, something uh, that could change the velocity based on the static pressure difference. So uh, in this case, you would have to use, the, there are special boundary condition types that allow for that. But unfortunately, if you were to simulate the presence of the fan itself as a boundary condition, you would have to consider the fan as a black box. So there would be a suction outlet and uh, a velocity inlet, for example. The problem with that is that you cannot maintain continuity of the flow. So if we have a hot flow on this side and we're pushing it through the fan itself, um, if you're sucking the air out, it's going to the void, and then it's being introduced with a different velocity. So this kind of joint inlet and outlet sections, they are not supported yet. And at the moment, you would need to have, uh, you would need to use the, the momentum source approach. Uh, Um, all right. Can we save present objects? Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to, uh, but if you mean like the, say I, you create a crack and then program it and then save it as a function block to be reused in the future. Oh, th this this is the thing. So basically, you could use the simulation itself, uh, but uh, whenever you change the geometry in a simulation process, or whenever you're making any kind of simulation, you will need to generate the mesh itself. So for any change, uh, significant change in the geometry, you need to remesh the whole domain. And uh, this is a significant uh, downside of, of the whole process. At the same time, it's it's a necessary step in order to have the the, the possibility of simulating the vo the air flow, at least with the methodology that we are applying. So uh, there is no possibility to actually have the CR uh, CRAC as a as a functional block. Uh, 
But at the same time, what you could do is have it analyzed and then use it as a black box, uh, in, in a way as a black box, where you would assign a certain boundary conditions to, to a given unit. So I would select uh, the, the section inlet, I would select the section outlet, I would select the sides and I would know what are the properties uh, in general of such a device. So in this sense, yes, but it's not uh, a single click thing. Okay. Uh, very good question. Can I show which kind of simulation type is used in this simulation? It's very easy. You go to the name of the simulation and then you can find the analysis type. In this case, we are dealing with convective heat transfer simulation. And these are the standard settings for, for a problem like this. So we are using the K-Omega SST turbulence model. This is a steady state simulation and we are not using Buzinesco approximation. We are actually expecting a high temperature difference and the model, uh, the simplified model would not be sufficient. Another question, can we simulate the CRAC failure and monitor changes over time? This would depend on the definition of failure, but yes, you could, for example, simulate uh, thermal performance or overheating of certain elements and see how, they, how do they develop over time or what are the conditions at which uh, the device performs and works in a stable way. So yes and no, but it really depends on uh, on the application that you're thinking about. I would highly encourage you to contact our representatives, present your case, what is it that you would like to simulate, and, or if you're interested for, for hobby perspective, post a question on the forum. There's a lot of people who would be very happy to answer you and help you with the problems that you're dealing with. Because like, you know, it, it's hard for me <laughs> to to put actually the, the, the to have the perspective of, on the complexity of the problem. Because there are aspects that we can deal with, there are aspects that are uh, beyond the scope of the tool that you have here in the web browser. There's quite a lot that you can do. All right, we are out of the question, uh, out of questions, and even better, we are out of time. So, <laughs> just on time. Once again, thank you very much for attending this webinar and this uh, demo of SimScale platform. I do hope that you enjoyed uh, this as much as I did. It was a pleasure and I hope to see you on the platform pretty soon working with your simulations and your problems. Have a great evening, have a great day. Rogo Sosnowski signing out. Bye-bye.